Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order the hybrid virtual Pasco County Board of County Commission meeting of January 12th, 2021. I would like to remind everyone to please silence all electronic devices and mute your uh, microphones. At this time, I'd like everyone to rise for the invocation and pledge of allegiance. O oh, merciful creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Here. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Here. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Here. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Here. Uh, again, I welcome everybody back uh, after the new year. It's been, most of you I haven't seen since last year. So the, um, we have a lot going on in this county and we have a lot of good things happening for the citizens of this county, a lot of projects. We have a very strong board that willing to tackle these projects and hopefully be the best for all of our citizens in Pasco County. Um, Mr. Steinsteiner, will you please uh, read today's proceeding with BCC? Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on March 12th, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners declared a local state of emergency after the governor issued executive orders 2051 and 2052, public health emergency and state of emergency related to COVID-19, most recently extended by executive order 2316 on December 29th, 2020. The board has chosen to hold the board meeting with a quorum physically present, utilizing communications media technology for the public and team members indicating the board's intent to conduct a hybrid virtual meeting has been posted on the board's website. On September 25th, 2020, the governor issued executive order 2244, moving the state into phase three of the governor's safe, smart, step-by-step -step order, which was extended by executive order 20. 297 issued on November 24th, 2020. Large gatherings of over 50 people are still not recommended to congregate in any public space that does not readily allow for appropriate social distancing. The state Surgeon General General's public health advisory is still in place with regard to maintaining social distancing and avoiding gatherings of 10 people or more. The public has been afforded to make public comments either in writing or by use of communication media te technology that has been provided. The board adopted resolution 2182 on June 30th, 2020, establishing the procedural rules for hybrid virtual meetings, such as the one being held today. As with any meeting that you take action, you are required to take public comment on any proposition pursuant to section 286.0114 Florida statutes. I'm available for any questions. Okay. Public comment. Now is the time for public comment. Citizens were given an opportunity to comment on any item coming before the board during the public comment section. The board also takes public comment on items to be placed on future board agendas or other business under their purview. Due to COVID-19 operations and safeguard and to safeguard the well-being and safety of the citizens and staff, today's public comment will be handled as follows. First, we will take public comment from those that have pre-registered at the WebEx link and are currently on queue. After, we will read into the record public comments, documents, PowerPoints, or videos that have been identified and met by the members of the public to be read out loud, played at the meeting, and or received in files. Finally, we will take public comment from the currently signed up at the kiosk station. Comments are not, should not exceed three minutes per person. 
this new format does not waive the request that when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against a commissioner or team member, but after directed the directed at the issues. This provides much respect between the board members and the public. For WebEx and uh, Kiox participants, after stating your name and address for the clerk, the timer will be activated and will start at a countdown. After two minutes, one beep will sound, letting you know that you have one minute to finish your comments. After the time, two beeps will sound, indicating three minutes are up and should close your comments. On WebEx, participants will be uh, disconnected when their time is up and kiosk participants will be asked to move away from the kiosk. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak on WebEx? No one is signed up on WebEx. Okay. Uh, so we go. Do we have any emails to be read to, into the record and received and filed? No emails were submitted. Okay. And I want to make clarification for the public comment. No emails were submitted. Hmm? You want to? For public comment, no yes. emails were submitted. No emails were submitted. Okay. Um, so we don't have any. Is anybody no. at the kiosk? Are you anybody at the kiosk? There's no one at the kiosk. That makes so we have no one to, at the kiosk and no one to speak at a public comment section. Okay, we move on to uh, consent items. And I have a pull sheet. Uh, Andrew Baxter, C-22, pull and revise. Uh, Barbara Hitzman, C-30, withdraw. And then I myself um, have pulled C-1, uh, a resolution for John Powers, who is here today with us. So um, what's the pleasure of the board on the other consent items? Move approval of the remaining consent agenda. Second. I got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Just, just for the clerk's per benefit, okay. and that includes the and then the consent addendum as well. That's a motion. Yes. Yes, so moved. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Okay. Uh, C-22. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. Andrew Baxter, Facilities Management Director. C-22 is being modified to change. On the change order, there is one instance where it referenced change order one. This should stay change order two. With that minor Scrivener's error change, we recommend approval. Move for approval, I was revised. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the changes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion passed. All right, C-30. That's withdrawn, excuse me. All right, C1. Um, like to recognize John Powers. I should have talked to you. Good morning, Chairman. Good, Good morning. Board members. How many years has it been, John? Well, it's been 19 and a half years. Um, been working with the county directly for almost 30 years. So. Been, uh, it's been been a very uh, eventful and uh, very well, very fulfilling uh, career, and, and had a lot of good uh, had a lot of good opportunities uh, through you all, and uh, we've accomplished a lot. And I got to tell you, you guys have a lot of good people out in the field, and it's been my honor to work with them. So, great, thank you, John. Anyone want to speak? I'd say, John, you've been a pleasure to work with. Um, you're just one of the most knowledgeable people I know in, in your field, if not the most knowledgeable person I know in your field. So you'll be truly missed, but I have a sneaky suspicion you're still going to be around. <laughs> will... I've offered my assistance. Uh, yeah. so there's a lot of going on. Right. So thank you for everything. 
Sure, all the best. Ms. Mariana. Uh, John, I'd like to say it's been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, your professionalism is, is just outstanding. Your relationship with your people, though, I think is just one of your greatest assets, too. You, you help cultivate people. You help cultivate situations with solutions and ideas every step of the way. Uh, you've been very innovative and very uh, pleasure to work with every, every step of the way. So wish you all the best. Well, thank you. Get them straight. <laughs> Likewise. And I would say the same. It's been a pleasure working with you and uh, look forward to your next endeavor. Yeah. Thank you. John, it, it has been a pleasure working with you. Um, I've known you for quite a while, but I, you, you've got to be one of the most intelligent people in that line of work. And I certainly appreciate your knowledge and the knowledge you've been giving me ever since I got on board to uh, know more about our solid waste and how it works. So, um, you've done a great job, and I know you're going to be around a little while longer and, and helping us go through the next steps to... Uh, Try to improve with uh, finding the right member that will lead us forward with solid waste. So, certainly appreciate all you do for us. Thanks. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you like to read the resolution? Yes. You ready? I am. Right. Resolution number 21-066, a resolution by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, commending John Power for over 19 years of dedication to Pasco County and congratulating him on his retirement. Whereas John Power began his employment with Pasco County on August 27, 2001 in the role of solid waste manager and served the last seven years of his career as a solid waste director. And whereas John Power has served Pasco County Utilities and the Public Infrastructure Branch with the highest levels of integrity and professionalism as the Solid Waste Director, and under John Power's leadership, the county's Solid Waste Program has become one of the premier solid waste programs in the country, receiving the Solid Waste Association of North America's Waste to Energy Excellence Award in 2015, Sustainable Florida's Sustainable Government Best Practices Award in 2016, and the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council's Future of the Region Going Green Award in 2015. And whereas John Power's innovative business-like approach promoted recycling and reduced operational expenditures through the beneficial use of waste to energy ash and obtained the first ever standing use permit in the United States in 2014. And whereas under John's direction, the Solid Waste Department has reused over 5,000 tons of ash in roadway construction and cement in, in cement manufacture and set the stage for significant future use that will increase the useful life of the county's solid waste assets. And whereas John Power extensively contributed to the solid waste industry through affiliations with several organizations and associations and served as the president of the Florida Waste to Energy Chapter of the Solid Waste Association of North America from 2015 to 2018. And whereas John Power provided outstanding leadership support and service during times of natural disaster to include the 2004 hurricane season, Tropical Storm Debbie and Hurricane Irma. And whereas John Power always displayed a positive attitude, cared deeply for all his employees, customers, and fellow citizens, supported his colleagues and his team in times of personal and professional hardship, and established a nationally recognized and award-winning solid waste program. And whereas on December 31st, 2020, John Power will have officially retired from Pasco County and will be dearly missed by his coworkers and colleagues. John was a leader, mentor, and friend. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, that said board hereby commends John Power for over 19 years of faithful, dedicated service to the citizens of Pasco County, congratulates him on his retirement, and wishes him all the best in his future endeavors. Done and resolved with a quorum present and voting this 12th day of January 2021. I already have a motion from Mr. Moore and a second by Commissioner Mariana. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passed. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. And, and I'd like to reiterate that uh, it truly has been a team effort, and it wouldn't have been done without the support of the board, and, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, John. go down and present this um i don't think we we can stand back here we all go down y'all gonna stand uh, up here i don't mind we can yeah, stand, we'll stand behind you i guess no they stay here that's fine we can stand up here. Uh. 
this prevent us from. You can stand up there, socially distance. Right, right, right. Stand here and yeah. yeah. Can we just stand back up to the? Uh, yeah. yeah. Just trying to maintain six feet. <laughs> off. <laughs> off with a. He can be off. You can if you stretch your arm enough. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. So R76 and R77 have been pulled and, and going to be on the, uh, or withdrawn from, from the regular agenda today. They will be at the 26th, January 26th meeting. Really update for Pasco Economic Development Council. Okay. This time we'll do R seventy four. Update. Morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Mike Bishop with the Pasco EDC. I'm here to give our quarter one Pasco EDC update. Start with the presentation here. So we're going to start with the MOU presentation. And the first slide. over there. I'll get going on. I think, can you, can you all see it right now? Okay. Yeah. So in our business recruitment project pipeline, this is a snapshot of our leads, add to projects and successes. And this is amongst our six target industries. So you'll see we have 40 active projects right now, a majority of which are in advanced manufacturing at 21. We also have two successes, one in high technology and one in advanced manufacturing. So diving into those two successes, you'll see that they account for roughly uh, 14 million in capital investment and 208 new jobs. And those charts at the beginning show the progress of those numbers towards our annual goals. Then onto the uh, business retention and expansion. These are highlights on the training programs, company visits, and training connections. I wanna point out these seven company visits are in-person visits. So COVID continues to be a challenge as we meet with businesses face-to-face. -face. On the next slide in our engagements, you'll see just a highlight, we attended two conferences, six events that we participated in, as well as three local presentations to uh, business groups. The marketing slides, to go through that um, very briefly, we had close to 128,000 in estimated earned media value. On the website analytics, you'll see that 86% of our new or of our users are new to the website, so that's encouraging. We're continuing to get new engagement with uh, with our website. On social, you'll see we have close to 8,600 total fans, 173 posts close to 123,000 total impressions and uh, almost 2,700 total video views that are on there. Onto our investor slide. So we have 82 current investors of which 34 of those are board or policy council members. We've raised close to 185,000 in, in private investment and we had five new investors this previous quarter. That is uh, Stevens Construction, the Usman Law Firm, Raymond James, Kokolakis uh, Contracting, rather, and J.E. Dunn Construction Group. So other leadership updates, we kicked off two new task forces this year. We have the uh, Reshoring Task Force, and that's chaired by Rachel Ebner of Stevens Construction. Um, that kicked off in December. 
as well as the Sustainability Planning Task Force, and that's chaired by Cynthia Spidell of Stearns Weaver Miller, and that also kicked off in December. We completed the uh, final evaluation of our performance um, for fiscal year last year and uh, made a, a new performance plan for this upcoming fiscal year that we're in, as well as uh, the Policy Council developing the legislative agenda for, um, for the upcoming legislative session. Upcoming events. Our next event that's coming up is January 29th. That's our virtual edX series. We're also targeting the end of February for our economic forecast luncheon, which is always uh, pretty well attended. Meet the projects is uh, going to happen in quarter two. It may be a hybrid uh, virtual um, situation and uh, grow Pasco on May 8th. I'll pause there. Any questions for those slides? Questions? Okay. I'll, um, I'll move on through the, uh, the penny presentation. There's a little retool to try and cover a majority of these things. So I'll, I'll kind of cruise through this. I apologize. I'm going to read a little bit from the slide just to highlight these. So in our ready sites, the seventh ready site is halfway through evaluation projected to be completed in February this year. The program, which you'll see in the in, um, forthcoming slide is up to six sites. So this would be the, the seventh site edition. A highlight on the international program, the Global Competitiveness Committee will continue through this fiscal year. Uh, kickoff meeting happened back in November and uh, currently working on recruiting Pasco Company to participate in the March uh, 2021 virtual international trade show and that's presented by Enterprise Florida. Enhanced marketing highlight there, Workforce Connect and report completed and distributed amongst other items you'll see on there. And Workforce Connect, You'll see uh, continuing to uh, work with partners to develop internship guide for PASCO businesses, as well as additional marketing plan for uh, Q2, distribution Q2. The CEO program, Dinner with a Shark, CEO Dinner, that's going to be a part of the uh, Grow PASCO event in May, and that's coming up. And uh, big news in Smart Start is the, uh, the uh, Smart Start at the Grove build out is pretty much complete. We're almost ready to move in there, and that will be our third incubator coming online, which is very exciting. So going through the, the ready sites highlight there, I already touched on, we have six sites. So one, one is uh, uh, in progress to move to the seventh. We had, um, apologize, three site inquiries, three response to RFPs, one presentation uh, to a developer uh, and uh, three site visits. You'll see the, the map of the ready sites there. So just to um, get through the different programs, I wanted to give a snapshot of the progress of these programs. You'll see on the, um, the ready site slide there, highlight is that we um, had two uh, marketing channels that, that have been executed to market these ready sites, uh, one through the business facilities advertorial, another through a business facilities full page ad. So you'll see amongst those goals there, we've, we've estimated we're about 45% complete. And so in progress, heavily in progress in the ready sites program. For the international piece, um, just wanted to uh, touch on, so you'll see there the different items that are in progress and the total uh, figures. We have uh, three there on the assist companies with export marketing discovery, um, assisted through SBDC, and that's goal of five, so that's on its way. But to go to the next slide in the highlight there, so there was an um, international workshop that was attended, and that was uh, virtually, it was the International Economic Forum of the Americas, Montreal, 2020. And that gives us a progress of the international program of uh, roughly 29%. CEO program is um, a little behind. This is very event related. So challenges with COVID um, impacting that. However, these planning, planning for these events are in progress. I mentioned the CEO dinner with uh, Kevin Harrington. That's part of Grow Pasco. And a lot of these will be backloaded at the end of the year. So um, hopefully we'll have some more to report for Q2. Workforce Connect, a lot of these figures are in progress. So that's uh, working through these goals. Just wanted to put that out there for you. So you can see that all these are started and part of Workforce Connect website integration, um, other things when working with Workforce Connect partners as well. And we got, we're roughly halfway there on that piece. So cruising through really quick on Smart Start so I can get to the progress there. So what continues to be a highlight is the amount of uh, event attendees and events offered through Smart Start. So continue to assist our small businesses in recovery and, and helping with COVID-related measures. 
We have 16 incubator members, as I highlight there currently, both on and off site. We're excited about this third incubator coming online. That number is going to continue to increase. And we've measured a, a continued impact of uh, roughly 214 jobs that have been created through this incubator program. In co-starters, you'll see that we uh, continue to administer that program. We had uh, three uh, co-starter graduates so far. Um, some of those pieces are also in progress as well. Uh, Pascal Enterprise Network, we are really, we're actually waiting on some uh, information to be uh, shared with us through the Enterprise Network partners. So we'll have to uh, keep you updated in the next quarter there. However, we did continue to hold round tables virtually and you'll see that number in the top right. Uh, moving on to, uh, there you go, uh, next slide. Um, our microloan program, so I believe we had, yes, we had two new uh, microloans that were closed. So that's to our, to our goal of five. Um, did work on some other pieces there, renewing software and other servicing measures. So that gives us a uh, roughly 46% completion of the Smart Start program there. And just to cap it off, just to try and give high level progress reports here, we're saying amongst all the programs, we're about a third of the way through. So we still have some work to go, but we continue to uh, move forward with administering these programs. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Good. Okay, great. Good. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. And move on to um, R75. Good morning, Chase. Hey, good morning. Do, do you guys have uh, my PowerPoint? Over here. Okay. I sent it to uh, Derek Berger a couple of weeks ago. If you need, I can I can reforward it. Sorry about that. We're uh, we're getting to the right person now. First of all, happy new year though. It's great to great to see you guys. I feel like I haven't been here in like eight, nine months, so <laughs> I don't remember how to tie a tie this morning. Yeah. We definitely hadn't seen you since last year. <laughs> it was nice not to see you guys on a TV screen or a computer screen or YouTube or what have you, so <laughs> Give us one moment to get it set up for you. Perfect, thank you. There we go. Perfect. So, um, so first of all, thank you uh, to Commissioner Starkey for for the interest in, in getting an update on the rental registry. Um, those of you who remember, this was passed last year, uh, Pasco County Ordinance 20-03, which required the registration of rental properties with the Pasco Sheriff's Office. 
Um, so it was passed on January 21st, 2020, which feels like a, a lifetime ago and took effect on April 1st, 2020. Um, for those of you who, who were here, you remember we, we worked a lot with the realtors groups and uh, and other entities, and then at the at the time, then Commissioner Wells um, with passing this uh, ordinance it requires registration for re for vacant property and rental properties, um, as you see there in, in section 18, within 30 days of a property becoming vacant or within, uh, at the time, 30 days of the ordinance beginning on April 1st, 2020. And then, as, as I'll discuss in a little bit, it requires penalties, but also provides for some exemptions. Um, every year, registry is re-required on the anniversary. And what we've been doing at the Sheriff's Office, um, obviously we haven't hit the anniversary of April 1st, 2021 yet, but we have a, a plan in place that will send an automatic renewal email to anyone who is registered with us, and they will just have to click a link to verify that the information is the same or change any information that, that they're required to change. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, though, there, there are exemptions. This is something that we, we worked on last year, like I said, with uh, Commissioner Wells and the, um, um, the, the rental management companies. So apartment complexes, for instance, are exempt. Um, any commercial businesses, churches are exempt. Um, so essentially, the, the rental registry requires those that have less than four units um, and that are not any kind of uh, housing or federal housing or, or state housing or urban development programs. Um, again, the, those exemptions are, are designed as, as part of to, to work this out and get this done, but also to focus on the most need that the sheriff's office and code enforcement were seeing. You know, for instance, the, the goal um, wasn't necessarily a, a thousand unit apartment complex or something like that, but was for more of the um, you know, the, the houses that were being rented out through Craigslist and, and through other channels um, that were possibly inherited from people um, who don't even live in the area anymore to give us a, a solid point of contact. Next slide, please. So with that, the Pasco Sheriff's Office created a rental registry website, which was, which was um, part of what was required by the ordinance. That is through citizen.pascosheriff.com, and we call it our Citizen Connect portal. From there, um, and this is a, a screenshot of what the what the website looks like when people get there, they have the ability to go register the rental property. We require um, several forms of information. So we, we need the owner of the property, a designated agent, someone that we can contact locally if the owner is not local. And again, the, the desire with this is not necessarily enforcement so much as it is compliance, because again, we're, we're not looking to write fines or, or tickets on this, but we're trying to get this necessary information for these people. So whenever we respond to a house or code enforcement responds to a house, they have someone that they can talk to, that they can contact and make sure that they're aware of the issues at the house and work with us in partnership and with county code enforcement in partnership to address whatever those issues are that, that we're seeing. Obviously, our, our plans to, to market this, as I, as I mentioned, it came into effect on April 1st, 2020, have been difficult because of the, the pandemic. Um, you know, whenever we had uh, talked about this ordinance, our, plans wa our plan was to attend community meetings, to attend HOA meetings, to make sure that everyone in our community was, was aware of this ordinance. We have been working with our local media outlets and our social media, though, to, to push out the, the flyer, as you see there on the right, um, that raises awareness to register, talks about who... Uh, needs to register, how they can register, where they can register, leads them to the citizen.pascosheriff.com rental registry website to put in their, their information for us. Um, again, we, we do have plans, um, you know, hopefully as, as the pandemic lifts and, and meetings um, resume sometime in, in the future to go to HOA meetings, to go to CDD meetings as well and, and get buy-in from those folks, make sure they're aware of this need to, to register these, these rental properties in Pasco County. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, um, there are also possible penalties and uh, and requirements. So, um, you know, penalties include not registering in a timely fashion, providing false information, not updating your your information in a timely fashion. The ordinance provides for for thirty days to update any of that information, and then it also provides for for possible penalties within the within the code structure, um, which includes citations. Um, notice prior to citations. And, and again, as I, as I mentioned, our, our goal with this is not necessarily enforcement on, on getting these, these penalties, but instead compliance with the, with the registry and getting people um, to register. So we are using a, an educational approach to this, as, as you'll see in, in, a, in a few slides. We're primarily using an educational um, approach to this in, in lieu of fines so far, which is to 
get people to make them aware of the ordinance and, and also make sure that they are registering and, and getting that information that they need. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, to date we have issued zero citations, but we do have 168 properties that have registered since April 1st, 2020. Um, again, those are properties with less than four rental units um, and with those, those no data exemptions. We also do plan to continue those awareness efforts. As I mentioned, um, some of our efforts have not been uh, possible this year because of the, the cancellation of meetings. Um, but as those restrictions lift, we do have plans to go to HOA meetings, CDD meetings, um, real estate meetings and, and realtor meetings to to discuss this, make sure people are aware of it. Um, but we are also, as we are responding to residences and we're, you know, we may be having issues there, county code may be having issues there and understanding, um, you know, and talking to the owner about the need to register. And like I said, to this point, we have 168 properties that, that have registered um, so far. Next slide. And I believe that's actually the, the last slide. Um, so I'm, I'm open to, to any questions or, or any information that, that you guys have, have on this. Questions? Thanks, Chase. Yes, um, and I get that the pandemic is causing a little havoc on this, but but that is a pretty low number. Mm -hmm. So um, I was thinking uh, if we could get creative with how to get the message out, and I have a couple of thoughts. One is to put your flyer in our um, bill that we send out. Was is that our either with Fasano with taxes or mm -hmm. our Pasco County Utilities? You know, sometimes we put informational pieces of literature in there. The uh, um, I would love to have that flyer to put in my newsletter. Mm -hmm. We can put it on our social media as well. And um, and then I would suggest maybe working with Mike Wells uh, in the appraiser's office to mm -hmm. um, identify the um, non-homesteaded properties. And, and let's think of some kind of mail campaign, a, a postcard or something um, to, to get a lot to get more compliance, so. Absolutely. Thank you. How many uh, numbers do we think we have? So that is a, a tricky question um, that we're still working on on the outcome to. We believe it's probably somewhere in, in the range uh, of approximately probably 1,000 properties. Um, but again, that is just. 1,000, uh, is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we, we. I think we have. You heard him right. <laughs> 50,000 rental homes yeah. in the county. I yeah, and, and that's just talking to to our code enforcement folks that, that they think based on the the exemptions and, and requirements. But that's you know a, a, again a number that we haven't really been able to to nail down. But we we do plan to use that um, non homesteaded property to to figure out that information. Well, definitely. Then you need to get I think with with Mike Wells to get that number because I think we have a thousand in Holiday Lakes alone. Mm -hmm. So at least a thousand. In Holiday Lakes. Yeah. This is the first time I've heard about it. Um, and I would definitely target the non-homestead. So, and if anytime they're sending out the property taxes, send the flyer along with the non-homestead properties, because I would never have known about it. So I'll be taking some notes here. Perfect. Okay. Mr. Mariana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would at least finish. Hey, Chase. Um, you know, seeing that number is a very low number. Um, I'm wondering if it's really a bad thing to see it so low because one of the things we were going to focus on was the troubled ones that you guys would have, a code enforcement would have. So if it's only 168 and that's all the troubled properties we had, it's, it's really kind of encouraging. Absolutely. And, and that is where the primary chunk of these registrations have, have come from to date is from um, our code enforcement deputies or, or county code enforcement whenever they respond to, to a nuisance property or, or place where we've had issues, making sure that those owners are aware of this. Um, we haven't seen a, a lot of registration um, without that, that guidance, that leadership. But like I said, we, we kind of attribute that to not being able to go to those meetings and get that, that messaging out. But yes, to your point, these these 168 are largely from um, those properties that we've had issues with and that we've responded to since this came into effect on, on April 1st. All right, and, and I think all the avenues we can to look at to get people registered is great, but those that don't want to register, and I can understand those that wouldn't want to, do you see anything, any glaring things that we're missing as far as who we're not going after or just people or just we don't have that many troubled, mm -hmm. troubled properties out there? Correct, and, and, that, and that's the key is so far we have not found anyone where we responded to a house. Um, we have not had any owners said, nope, I don't want to register, I won't do it. Um, whenever owners become aware of it, especially the, these problem houses or their registered agents become aware of it, everyone has, has been more than willing to register, give us the information. Um, but that's where the, those penalties are, are important as, as we have, you know, if we do run into issues where we have owners who 
don't want to register, refuse to register, we, we then have the ability to, to levy those penalties and those citations to um, get that compliance. Okay. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. Chair. Commissioner Starkey. Um, when we had our workshop, mm -hmm. um, we uh, had comments from multiple companies who have rental divisions, and I'm thinking of Berkshire Hathaway as, for one, um, and they have thousands of them, I think, that they are that are under their umbrella in the county. So I think you should be contacting those um, companies that have um, managers of rental properties and getting their lists. It's also a, a way idea. to add many more to That's that. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Um, is this the same list that the people that have seasonal homes register with so they can have Pasco sheriffs to keep an eye on their homes as well? No, ma'am. Those are, those are two separate lists. Um, so we have a, the um, vacation home uh, that our CSUs will, will go and drive through and make sure that um, you know, nothing looks amiss or no broken windows as, as they can, um, but different from, from rental homes. Um, the, the vacation homes are, are largely not rented out as, as we're finding. It's primarily owned by the individuals. Um, so they go on that list to have our CSUs just make sure, you know, glass isn't broken, windows aren't broken, things okay. like that. Will they also be on that list because ha those homes are vacant half of the year? Mm -hmm. So that is um, something that we, uh, I remember, I think we talked about, and, and maybe the county attorney can, can help me. I remember we talked with um, Ms. Sims, but I believe it's only if um, they are not, I think vacation homes wouldn't, wouldn't count because of the... I think we excluded the, the folks that were, that were... Not renting them. I mean, the, the, the whole purpose yeah, that, that was, was my the, belief. It was a, it was a <laughs> rental registry, and those people who were, uh, it was their home, and, and they, just chose they chose not to live there, not to be in it for six months out of the year. They didn't have to register. Yeah, that, that was my belief as well. Thank what about you. the vac You said vacant. It's registered um, for rental or vacant homes. So if they're vacant, how are you going to contact those people? Or because technically this. The seasonal homes are vacant for several months out of the year. I, I believe it's vacant from rental. So, so for instance, if you are renting a house, um, you, you have to be on, on the list. But then if you also have that house up for rent and it has not been rented for, for 30 days, then we also require um, registration. That's um, through, through those rental companies and things like that. Thank you. Chairman, just one okay. thing. Thank you, sir. Um, Chase. I don't want to say this is off topic because you mentioned it earlier, but um, I know you're not looking at the large multifamily apartment developments at this time with this ordinance, mm -hmm. but they do have their own challenges and cause their own challenges to the department, do they not? Absolutely. The, the amount Absolutely. That, are, that, that are in Pasco County now are causing challenges to the sheriff's mm -hmm. office for the sheriff's office. Absolutely, and, and um, you know that's something that we we had uh, initially talked about with with this registry. Should it include the, those large apartment complexes? Um, some. Early things that we had considered is is maybe having a, a notice posted on the department complexes with a number that the sheriff's office could could contact with issues um, that didn't make it in, into final drafts as we as we talked to to other entities and groups. But yes, sir, to, to your point, um, you know we, we do see obviously you know, any any apartment complex, especially you know some of the the larger developments, um, could add the population that that you would see in a in a small city. Um, so those add you know obviously. Criminal concerns, just whenever you're adding that many people, um, obviously crime is going to happen. Traffic concern on on roads, um, th things like that. Obviously, you know, not contemplated within this within this registry, but that we we do see. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't, if there's no more questions, I'll move for approval. I don't believe it's it. just a presentation. There's, 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 no, there's, no need of, there's no need for approving this. No, no it's just no. presentation. It's just we do appreciate your approval. I thought the changes. Okay. Well, yeah, good. <laughs> Can you He's email already me been the approved. flyer and I'll get it to help get it out? Absolutely. I'll email the flyer um, and, and Commissioner Fitzpatrick as, as well. You would, you would like it? Yes, please. And can we share that on Facebook and other social media? As Absolutely. Well? Absolutely. And, and we're sharing on the, on the Sheriff's Office page as well. So um, any, any help that, that you guys have on your, uh, whether it be your personal social medias or through the, through the county social media, we always appreciate it to the, to the clerk as well. Yep. Send it to me and then we'll get out there. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys again. Thank you, Chase. Okay. Again, I'll state that uh, R76 and R77 have been moved to January 26. Uh, R78 is a time certain at uh, 11.45 for pictures for the today for the commission. 
And I believe after we take those pictures, there's also photos for the human trafficking out, out front. Are you in charge of that? Yes. So, okay. Commissioner Fitzpatrick will lead us out there once we take the pictures inside. For now, we move on to um, old business. We'll start with uh, Commissioner Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, thankfully, we have a lot of time because I do have probably my longest list ever, unfortunately. But lots of good stuff after I get through the first one, because the first one is I just wanted to recognize the, um, the passing of our uh, state attorney, Bernie McCabe. As many of you know, he did pass away over the holiday break. Um, just such, such a kind man but a, and, and a dedicated man. Um, to the entire region when it comes to um, Pinellas and Pasco County. He, I, he also said on my public safety coordinating council that I, that I chair, and I always appreciated obviously his insight and um, his knowledge um, on that on that council. So, you know, my prayers and our, I'm sure all of our prayers continue to be with his family. So we, he will definitely, definitely be missed. The second one, um, on behalf of the DMO, I have a recommendation for an appointment to the vacant position of the Tourist Development Council. Um, again, on the recommendation of the DMO, um, they would like to appoint Bobby D. Felipez of the Spring Hill Suites by Marriott Suncoast. Um, they wanted to keep something obviously over there close to the west side again, and it had to be a hotelier. Um, Bobby's involved in our community on an, and actively involved with the DMO already. Um, participates in events and has done many things for the for the DMO and uh, on the recommendation of the T TDC, I'll make that motion to approve Mr. D. Felipez as a member of the TDC board. You got a motion? Have a second. Second. Okay. This, a I don't second. I don't know why people didn't jump in for seconds, but <laughs> you know, but there's a second there. Yeah, a second right here. So, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passed. Okay. okay, a few more things. Um, next request um, I have, and you've probably seen letters from the sheriff in the past. Um, I'd like to add a representative from the sheriff's office to the planning commission. I think what we need to do is get obviously, the, okay, the entire board and then give the county attorney's direction to uh, draft that addition. But uh, I've spoken to Sheriff Nako. Um, obviously, he's in favor of that. If you remember the past letters that he sent, in addition, it's come up quite a few times in conversations I've had with him recently. Um, so it would definitely be an asset um, with the growth of the county and the concerns when it comes to public safety, as well as the traffic concerns. Um, they need to be represented on the Planning Commission. We do have the school board that's on the Planning Commission. Um, it would only benefit us to have the Sheriff's Office have a representative on the Planning Commission. Mr. Steinstein. Um, the school board is on the planning commission only for the purposes of increase in residential density, and that's by statute. Oh. I'm not sure that you couldn't put a representative of the sheriff's office on it, but that would require the uh, every require a land development code amendment to change that composition. Right. Yep. So I, I don't understand the traffic it, um, part of that because. They're involved with speeding, right? Speeding. Sure. But what congestion is not part of the sheriff's wheelhouse? And I'm assuming that's after what Chase just said, that's kind of what you're thinking. And that, I don't know. It just, it just seems kind of odd to me to put the sheriff, I, I, I mean, if you look the at the letters, the planning commission. I, I mean, I think to be not, did you guys not see the letters of him requesting to be on it in the past? No. No. Um, he sent them in the past. It's been quite some time. I've never seen that. Okay. I think, uh, Chase, you want to forward those to them real quick? Is there <laughs> They're any, old. They're, is it's there, been a while. Is there any planning commission think, in the state that has law enforcement? I am not aware of it, I, but I would have to research that. And, and is there anyone at the sheriff's office with planning background? Or? So when I, the most recent conversation I had with the sheriff, he, he does have obviously someone in mind that he would like to uh, appoint to that. 
So, so to uh, Commissioner Moore's point, I believe where, where the sheriff is, is thinking on that is obviously, as, as uh, Commissioner Moore noted b before, you know, obviously any time um, that there are new developments that come in, obviously there, there could be um, criminal elements to that. And so you know, there, there are the concerns with, with SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design, um, guardhouses, gates, security cameras, lights, um, you know, and, and to uh, Commissioner Starkey's point as well about, about speeding, obviously anytime you add more cars on the road, you obviously add, add more people that are, um, you know, speeding, people looking for, for through routes and trying to get off major thoroughfares, but then relate to um, traffic coming down main roads. So I believe that was the, the sheriff's in, intent was that, was that so many of those things that do come through um, the planning commission and, and those elements, we would just um, you know, appreciate the opportunity to, to have eyes on as they go through and, and make recommendations on things like, um, you know, maybe some security um, apparatuses that, that could be there to, to improve the, the criminal environment or, or concerns whenever it comes to, you know, staffing, manpower, thing, things like that, that, that are caused by those developments. I don't think those issues are discussed at the Planning Commission. I think that's a different kind of committee. Mr. Chairman. Chair. Uh, yeah. Mr. Stein, Commissioner Starkey is right. What what I'm hearing Chase say is that the sheriff wants a role in design, which which is not would be a may need a seat at the table at ordinance review yeah. where we're and developing I the land development code changes. Um, but if somebody is coming forward with a residential project in a Euclidean zoning category, a straight zoning category, mm -hmm. the planning commission nor this board has any say other than yay or nay. Um, but if it's a issue of design, then that's part of your land development code. And while the planning commission does review that, that's a very small percentage of their job. And, um, and now you, it kind of rings the bell that I think the sheriff has asked to be at the table in those discussions. And what comes to my mind is the trouble that we're having in Copper Spring. So mm -hmm. in the design of that neighborhood, there is a cut through that where people are speeding and um, sheriff is having to be out there all the time um, dealing with the people speeding through the middle of that neighborhood. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm fine to have a safety voice in, uh, in that, where that committee lies because I think that would be great to have actually. <laughs> so. So that would be more on the uh, issue of, of when they go to uh, building construction, when they start discussing those projects coming in Mr. planning. Mr. Chairman, Thank can it be a checkbox that they get to comment on the safety aspect and the future troubles they see might come from a plan design? Mr. Chairman. Um, what may be beneficial or not, um, a lot of the, com I, don't, I shouldn't say a lot, there are communities that are requesting for changes to allow law enforcement in within their communities, but the law enforcement's not allowed in specific communities due to the fact that the signs are not up to code and things like that. So I understand that aspect with code, but maybe if we can, I don't know if they come in at ground level and help with the aspect of sheriff's office is going to be allowed to come into that community or not in that community. So if I may, okay. the yeah. issue that Commissioner Fitzpatrick raises is state law that says that the sheriff's office is only allowed to patrol county roads unless there is a traffic enforcement agreement in place. <clears throat> traffic enforcement agreement is available to any community that say CDD or private HOA, but the sheriff's office needs the signage to meet uh, the manual on uniform traffic signage, the green traffic book, um, or they're not allowed, or they can't write tickets. So the 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 fix there, which wouldn't be popular, is that in the land development process, they are not allowed to have decorative signs. Because that's where that's what's happening is that communities like CDDs are putting in decorative signs. They don't they don't meet standard. They don't have reflectivity. Um, 
then they're required when they have traffic problems to go through and upgrade all their signs at a large cost cost when the citizens finally when the residents finally take over control of the CDD um, that, again that's is that implemented during planning or the design phase that would be that's a basic issue in your land development code you could you could stop that from happening by changing the land development code to say private or public has to have si uh, internal signage that meets the, the manual. Um, because currently now the when a private development comes through the site plan review, they can put in signage that is decorative, quote, decorative and doesn't meet strictly meet the, the manual. Mr. Marano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I welcome the Sheriff's Office to get involved in setting the land development code to make those changes that we'll actually look at before we finalize anything anyway, coming forward, but I, I don't think we need to have them on the, on the zoning board. A planning commission, I should say. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Moore. So, I guess I don't understand the apprehension, but um, to have somebody appointed by, you know, from the Sheriff to be on the planning commission when, you know, anything and everything that's approved does have some type of impact on law enforcement. And that's what they're asking. They're asking to be involved in those discussions. So if a, if a, any type of, I don't want to just say a development, but any type of um, item that comes up, they can actually give input on. So if there is a high crime area um, or the potential for being a, a additional crime or to have an additional impact on the sheriff's office, which in turn, impacts this board's and our future decisions when it comes to their budget, I don't understand the apprehension of, of, of allowing them to be on there and having input. I mean, we, we've seen time and time again on our, on our surveys that I know Mark is going to uh, go over here soon. I'm not sure when that's coming up this afternoon, I think. No, next meeting. Okay, sorry, next meeting. Um, public safety always ranks number one. Um, I'd actually like to see even um, fire rescue even have probably more involvement at the same time. Um, but we do have obviously, you know, Mr. Biles and others that, you know, do attend or give input. So they're able to do that. Um, but the sheriff as really as a, a separate entity, in fact, um, I think should have additional input and, 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 and be able to and be able to be participate in these discussions. So I would hope that, uh, you know, this board would um, entertain that. Yes. Um, I think that uh, we take public comment and certainly we hold the sheriff's comments in high regard. And I would think that that his comment, that he should come to the meetings, maybe comment. However, having a vote, being a voting member, I, I, for me, it's just not the right place for, for them, I think, but I, do want them to be more involved in what Chase mentioned, um, and that is the um, uh, the design of a neighborhood for um, less um, for better safety for the residents and less um, problems um, that the sheriff has to deal with. I think that's I think that's a really good idea. So that's that's where I am on. I would be a no for the planning, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. How many people sit on that board? Right now it's six five. plus a school. Six plus a school district. Seven. Seven people. So with an eight person, it, the only thing is it would have a split vote? There's, I've never seen that before. but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> To me, it just seems like um, it, it doesn't quite fit in the in the mission but it does fit somewhere in in planning mm. and in building construction and have a say in in those safety issues for any development coming forward so well mr chairman just this is a follow-up when we, we talk about building but you know there's a lot of things that the planning commission does and and oh, I know. We, you yeah. know in addition to that and i'm sure you know somebody from staff could speak to that if they like but i i i, I know because it's brought up on this dais quite often that I mean, how many commissioners that sit behind this dais 
are reaching out to the sheriff's office on a regular basis about issues that are going on in the communities. I know for a fact it happens. I'm sure if they were to log the calls from this board and how many times they hear from us, um, that it's, 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 there's a lot. And I know more than others. So I know now we're, you know, yeah, now we're giving them an opportunity to, um, you know, uh, have that input from the beginning. So maybe those questions and those, and those issues don't come up in, in the future. And a lot of them do come from this board. It's a fact. I could see where it would be beneficial. Have an additional person from the community have a voice. It's a different insight. It's a totally different insight. But again, I mean, if yeah, but I'm still talking. Um, but if the, um, you know, again, if, if the, the, this commission doesn't feel that it's a benefit, I guess then those people don't feel it's a benefit. But let's, uh, Terry Pito's right behind you. Let's see him answer. He's in planning. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Terry Pito's planning and development director. I think the, um, if the intent is to look at design and consider the various safety aspects of it, um, catching a project very early in the process would be most helpful. Um, at the planning commission, often that's at least um, at best two or three months into the life of a project. Um, and in some cases, it could be even deeper than that. It could be seven, eight months into the life of a project which is fairly late in the game. So I think if you're really interested in, in looking at design, there is the point of the pre-application that takes place even before a project is submitted where multiple county departments provide their input uh, to a project such that when the developer, the entity approaches the county with a complete application, they ideally have addressed many of the issues that have been given to them by the various county departments. And um, it would be a good place, I think, for other agencies to participate um, in the, in the pre-application stage of a project very early. Comments are known at that point and can be cascaded and addressed down into the review process and into the life of the project all the way through the Planning Commission and the BCC. However, I wanna to mention too, that a lot of the projects that go to pre-application meetings, yes, many of them are zoning related, particularly MPUDs, um, but also many of them are site plan related, which is an administrative review, which those projects don't go to the planning commission for review. So your site plans and things of that sort don't often go to the, the, the planning commission. Um, so the pre-application is a great place in, those pro in the life of those projects to get that safety input um, from places like perhaps the sheriff's office or traffic ops, et cetera. Um, and in that way, those comments are ensured for those projects that don't appear at a planning commission. Great, great points. And, um, you know, I kind of remember having one of my coffees with the sheriff and us talking about having them be part of the, that process. So I think, I think you're spot on that we need to engage them in those uh, conversations much earlier. Yeah, I think early on when you start those projects, I think that's good. So I have a motion on the floor. Sure. I have a motion. I made a motion. You made a motion? Mm, to add the sheriff to the planning commission. Mm -hmm. I have a motion. I don't know if we can do that. Or... He, I mean, he can, he can uh, the commissioner can clearly make a motion to, to add the plan, uh, to go through the process of changing the land development code to add the sheriff's position. Um, but you need a second. Yeah, that's that's the motion. Okay. I'll second right. it. I'll still have a motion and a second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Nay. Like sign. Nay. 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 Motion uh, fails to pass by three two vote. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, let me go ahead with my other items real quick. Was there a rec? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, is there a recommendation for? Because they said to start him off sooner. Which position or which? So, if currently we are not including the 
the sheriff's office in the initial distribution, like we do with fire and, and other agencies of, of site plans, I, we can do that without the board taking any action. And, but the administrator may wish to address that. <laughs> but we, we are, we're distributing all residential projects to the sheriff's office early in the process. Now, we'll connect with the sheriff's office, make sure we're sending it to the right spot. We'll do that today to make sure we're sending it to the right spot and that they're involved early in the process. Mm -hmm. we, but we do that just like we do with fire rescue and all the other agencies that may be impacted. So they basically the fire rescue and all sign off on those projects like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mr. Everybody? Chair, you said the fire department signs off. So does the sheriff have to sign off on it as well? They haven't in the past, I don't think. Yeah, they're part of the review process. Now, whether or not they get a check the box or not, I don't know. There's a fire code that gives a fire marshal the authority to, you know, drive some things that doesn't necessarily exist on that on that side. So there, the limiting factors are what's in the land development code that we can enforce and what's in the building code. And typically, neither of those are well. Fire code is relevant to site plan, but. It's really the land development code when the site during the site plan process. So you can't enforce a requirement that doesn't exist in land development code. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is that everything? Mr. No, I got two more things. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but thank you, um, Commissioner Fitzpatrick, for bringing up what you did. So I think um, since t since that didn't since that motion failed, um, but Terry did make a, a, an additional suggestion. Uh, I would assume you're going to probably maybe reach out somebody will reach out to the sheriff's office and invite them to have a member at the pre-app meetings if yep, they would yes. like so now obviously it's up to the sheriff if you'd like to do that but um let's can we if everybody's good with that let's can we give that invitation Absolutely. Yeah. yes sir okay yes sir thank you okay okay just two more things um before i have a slide but before i do that i did want to talk a little bit about um and i'm sure others do as well um, about the COVID vaccines that are lacking to, here in Pasco County. Um, yesterday, Pasco County was supposed to receive, and I say Pasco County, let me, let me backtrack on that. The health department, the Florida Department of Health that's located in Pasco County, which oversees the vaccines and the vaccines are sent to the Florida Department of Health, not the county itself. <laughs> um, they were supposed to receive 3,500. Mm -hmm. They reserve, received zero, as we all know, and we all saw the obviously letter from Mike Napier. Um, Dan and the, um, Fossa and, and Mike and I had some multiple calls and they had reached out yesterday and, and I went ahead and called um, Jared Moskowitz up uh, in Tallahassee. He's the Florida Emergency right. Management Director. Um, had a conversation with him and I, I appreciate him taking my call. Um, I was able to get a, him to send at least a, a, a thousand. Yeah. And again, while I, I do appreciate that, that's not enough. Um, if you look at the numbers here in Pasco County, I know our, our current population we're guesstimating is 560. I'm, I'm sure when the census come out, comes out, it'll be closer to 600,000. I'm going to assume, um, of a population like that and about a third of our population being over the age of 65. If at that rate, if we continue to receive vaccines at that rate, um, at, well, let me back up and I apologize. I know that um, Senator Burgess was able to, obviously, um, after having some conversations with him, and I know Commissioner Oakley had some conversations as well, I think he was able to get another 500 that's going to come too. So we're going to end up with 1,500 this week. And we appreciate Senator Burgess and all his efforts in helping out with that as well. Um, and the other legislators that have participated and made calls. And other legislators as, uh, did as well. And I talked to Senator Simpson as well as um, and um, Representative um, Maggard. But at that rate, so if we were to get, uh, let's say, um, 1,500 a week, it would take about seven and a half years to vaccinate the population here in Pasco County. If we were to get what we had last week at 3,500, it would take approximately three and three and a half years to vaccinate the entire population of Pasco County. Every one of us have been, are getting the calls and the emails from our constituents. And I know that each and every one of you, as well as I do, wish that we could do more for them. 
unfortunately, right now, only thing we can do is ask and beg. Because I, I, I really feel like I was begging yesterday, honestly, yeah. on behalf of our citizens. We need more vaccines in Pasco County. Now, I'm going to go to Dan real quick, because so, I asked Dan to look at some numbers. Dan, do, do we have those numbers for how many vaccines Pinellas County received in Hillsborough? Because I know Hillsborough County actually received about 11 and a half thousand or so yesterday, 11.2. They received quite a few yesterday. And they originally had 9,000. Um, Jared told me that when I was on the phone with him that Pinellas, now I, can, I can't confirm this, but he did tell me on the phone that Pinellas received like 25,000 last, last week. Well, they're at 900 and something thousand. We're about 600,000. It do, yeah, I know. It doesn't seem to work out. So, Dan, what numbers do you have? But, share? Yeah, I don't have the exact number that no, they are tough. getting because that, that's not part of the state's recording, right. reporting process. It's on the public side. So I have how many shots, so actual how many vaccines are being distributed. And, and, and to, be, to be honest, the entire region is being shorted if you look at our population. So not just Pasco, but Hillsborough is being shorted. The whole region's being shorted yep. for other parts of the state. And so, you know, Pinellas is close to where you should be based on population. Um, but they're a little negative when you, when I, I updated it this morning with yesterday's numbers from vaccines that, that are in the region. So of the six counties that I captured in the region, Hernando, Hillsboro, Manatee, Pinellas, Polk, and Pasco, only one has actually gotten more vaccine distributed, I, I actual shots in the arms than they would have if you normalized by population. And they're only like a couple percent over that. Everybody else was negative. So it's not just a Pasco issue, it's a region issue. We aren't getting the vaccines distributed uh, as opposed to some other regions. So, you know, Pinellas has done the best. They've gotten almost 30,000 people vaccinated. Uh, and Hillsborough had a pretty good jump over the last couple of days. They're up to 44,000. When I looked two days ago, Hillsboro was actually below Pinellas. So they've done a pretty significant, significant job over the last couple of days in Hillsboro. But again, those are regional. So the people that live in the region can go to any of those. And we've added the links to every county site in the region to go register to our website. So if you go under coronavirus, you have the links to every other Department of Health in the region. So if you want to go register in Polk or Hillsboro, you have the ability to do that because they cannot restrict by location. We also added the link to Publix. So if you want to drive up to Hernando or Citrus, where Publix is actually giving them out, that link's on our website, too, where you can go register at the Publix site. So we're, we're, we're trying to push it out there, but as the commissioner said, we're short, and we're at the rate we're getting, it's six-plus months just to get the over-65 community. Where, where are we at? If you're at 30 and 44, where are we at? What's that? Pinellas is at 30,000. As of 40, yesterday, Pasco has given... 16,700 shots. Now, that's not just the yeah. health department. That's everybody. That's health communities, everybody. That's the state's number. Yeah, I want to reiterate that before right. Commissioner Starkey has this question because I want to make sure you separate how many right. vaccines have come through the health department. Right. Let's not – I, I yeah. hate to count as, because as of the hospitals receive right. their own for their health care right. workers, which is separate from what the county – or not the, the health department yeah. received to give to the general population. In all those – Which getting, was 3,500. Right. And, and then in addition to that was some from our, for our frontline workers, which right. brought that over to like about 4,100. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The health department's given out so 30, have, roughly about 35, 3,600 shots. The health department has. And they, I can't speak on Mr. 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 Nate Pierre, so. but I know he said they were giving out 500, but they can have the capacity to give out 1,200 to 2,000 a day. We could, 2, we could probably give out close to 2,000. Uh, right, so 2, with two locations. Day, but... We're working on getting an east side location opened up. But again, it's. So we not, only have enough for two they're days. They're not <laughs> location dependent. Anybody can register for them. So. Sorry. Yes, sir. Sir. Um, when I had a conversation with um, the health director, he said that we, as quick as we can give it out, we can get more. So I'm wondering, did Hillsborough and Pinellas have have some kind of uh, system set up that they're giving it out through more than just their health department? Because I'm trying to Ooh. figure out why we're being shorted. Right. So, you know, the health systems are getting vaccine right. too. And so, you know, it's going to the health systems. The the initial priority there was the healthcare frontline healthcare workers, and so that was the initial priority. But in all, in all at all the health systems, and then they have the ability to give out to sixty five and older community too. So it's just a that's why the state number of sixteen thousand in Pasco is different than the health department's 
what they've given out of 3,500 is different. And, you know, that's why the numbers are so different is because there's health systems and much of that is going to healthcare workers, which that's, that's, that's the fine. first priority, right? And so as of Mike gets, gets rid of his vaccine as quickly as he gets it. If he gets it on Monday, then over the seven days, they get rid of it and they get to zero by Sunday. Yeah. But for us to get zero is unconscionable and uh, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, number one, number two, um, aren't our guys going, at, you know, we house that group here in, pa in Pasco County and they're going into Pinellas and administering in their nursing homes, so, right? In Hillsborough. So, and in Hillsborough. Have they come yes, in, pa are they so administering they, in Pasco yet? Yeah, so that's a state mission that we are running, but the missions and then where the locations they're going are directed by the state. Now, some of those have been in Pasco, but the vast majority of their initial mission was long-term care facilities in Pinellas. That was their initial mission. And then they've done both missions in Hillsborough, Pasco and Pinellas over the last several days. On Sunday, they were down at the governor's uh, initiative with uh, the minority churches. They were down at one, I can't remember which one our teams went to, but they were down there on Sunday uh, so, giving shots out, so. You know, I, I get that we're only one or two weeks into this, but it seems like it's a case it's it's a um, unfortunate distribution mm -hmm. plan, mm -hmm. and I would say stronger words, but I'm going to be politically correct. <laughs> and um, well, is there a way that we can have a voice that makes sense to help uh, set up a better system? Mr. Moore, have you had that conversation? So I'll, I'll tell you. So when I had that conversation yesterday with Mr. Moskowitz, you know, uh, stating that we were supposed to have the 3,500, why didn't we get 3,500? He did state there was a shortage. Um, it was, these are his words. There was, a, there was a shortage. We weren't getting as many from the federal government as expected. But I, I have, if you look at the webs, I think the, some tweets that went out from the department, I think it was, and Ralph, you shake your head yes or no, wasn't there about 2.2 million that were get, they, they mentioned last week, I think. It came to the state? Wasn't it a week? Oh, let's find that number again, because I have it real quick. Let me, and I apologize, let me pull it up. Um, he mentioned yesterday that they had a, yesterday, this was just yesterday, I don't know what's coming today or the next, or, 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 or in the afternoon yesterday. He <laughs> stated that um, they had 170,000, I think 175,000 left. And that's kind of where I made the statement of, okay, if you have 175,000, and you do it by the size of a county, the average size county is about 313,000 people in, in the state of Florida, 67 counties. If Even if you divided that at, by five, each five, county, seven. it's two and a half thousand doses per county. If you do it by the size of the county, we would have been in the five to 6,000 range. So I don't understand the numbers or how they are getting distributed. If there's 175,000 there, why do we only get, well, none? <laughs> Yeah. Until the call, a thousand and then another 500. And I think right here with the one I think it said week four vaccine update, Florida has received 1.2 million doses. We are expecting to receive 250,000 additional allocations throughout next week, which this is next week, right? So according to the uh, Florida Emergency Management website, they put out for week four of the vaccine update, uh, a total of vaccines received for the state of Florida, 1.2 million doses. Um, as of week four, they had uh, individual vaccinated 514,000. And then this week they were putting out an additional 250,000, which still leaves a difference in the amount that we have at the state mm. to the numbers that they're, they're putting out. So okay. shall we maybe craft a letter to the governor and to Jared yeah. requesting that the, the vaccines be distributed per capita in a, in a fair and uniform manner? It's a great idea. It's also can see a motion. Yeah, I'll second that. I would uh, think that very, very good when you do craft a letter. Yeah, and I, so I and and also I would suggest that we um, talk to FAC and get their support behind that that kind of movement uh, because every county's if, if some are getting more than others, it's Why? just like uh, during the hurricane when we had the debris <laughs> removal fight. Um, it's ugly, right. and and we don't need to be fighting each other. And, and, you know, I just, 
I think that letter would be appropriate. Yeah. And I, I, I second that. I think it was a motion. Yeah. Okay, here, I have a quick question because what concerns me is going into the primary care physician doctors and they're saying, and I asked the different doctors and they're like, yes, three of the four doctors in that primary care physician, they have gotten vaccinated because three of them go into the hospitals. Yep. But even our primary care physicians are not being vaccinated, which I find a very alarming because they are seeing the patients and we don't need any pediatricians, primary care doctors getting COVID and exposing it to the rest of their patients. So let's get that letter off immediately and get yeah. our fair share. So I have a... Uh... I have a motion and a second to draft a letter to the, I guess, to the governor. The governor and uh, Jared. Yes, and sir. I would CC Chris Browles and Wilton Simpson. Maybe. Yeah. We can do that. All yes, those in favor of that say aye. 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 Okay. Ms. Ms. Chairman? Yes, sir. I think we need to get a federal letter as well. When I look at New York, yes. wasting all their vaccines, not getting them out there, we need to get Florida up in the front as well. So yeah. I think to our I agree. Uh, federal de hey. delegation, we should send one out to, to them as well. You want to add that to that motion? I have one for the federal and one for the state. So Sounds great. That Good okay? idea. Great idea. And I, and I, 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 just, I just continue. Uh, to, yeah, because I have so, a question, but you may yeah. hit on it. Okay. So I'll wait. Well, uh, <laughs> if you don't, I'll... So, uh, but I, and I do want to reiterate, you know, we appreciate everybody's effort and their hard work. And I know for a fact, Mike Napier, um, County staff, including um, Chief Asa, are, are doing an excellent job with what they have, but right. they can only do with what they have. And, you know, the, unfortunately, they're feeling the, the brunt of it. I mean, poor Mike Napier had to deal with um, a, um, a fake um, right. so, tickets. T yes, line a, or t um, deal on, right. on, uh, on the web where people were signing up. Somebody was scamming people and they showed up in line. They had to tell them, no, that's terrible. You yeah. feel so bad for them, but you know we really feel bad for the citizens. And lately, over the last couple of days, instead of just returning emails, I've been actually asking people for people's phone numbers and talking to them on the phone um, because I just want to hear what they have to say well, and what they're having I've, to go through. I've gotten I mean, some of the same emails, and, I've, and you hear it out on the in the but, county from our but, citizens. It's all us. So, we're in charge yeah. of that, and so, we're really not. Yeah. And yeah. and the fact of it is. Uh, Mike Napier and, and Andy Foss and the whole group and all of our staff are doing the best they can with what they get. Yeah. But so, just, yeah. That's we were I'm supposed saying. to open up uh, St. Leo for a drive through this week. Well, with absolutely getting none on Monday and then, then hearing only 1,000 today, but then I heard we added 500. But that's just not acceptable. We, we got to have more vaccines to, for this county. And we we sit here, open. and all the vaccine goes to all the other counties. Yeah, we'll never get our population I vaccinated. Yeah, can I, I just can, you, can I just finish my last okay. sentence, if you don't mind, real quick? Um, <laughs> so just moving going on again. So when they set up these sites, I mean, I heard lots of positive responses that it went smooth, it went quick, they did a great job. Pasco County is utilizing paramedics to support this, yes. you know, oh, yeah. we are, we are using paramedics to support this cause. So we're, we're willing to do anything. And as we had the conversations yesterday, just like, you know, it was brought up by one of you a little minute ago, we can not, we, the health department can do with the support of all can do at least 2000 a day on the West side. And they might be able to do 2000 on the East side of the County a day too. So that's possibly 4,000. If we have the vaccines, come to the county the people will get their vaccine they will get them they will be immunized there that's the fact we just need them gotta have them i heard the sears location is doing very well in distributing and they did a very good job with covid testing and i heard other counties were trying to replicate that and they were actually being shut down so if we're able to vaccinate and test and everything like that, then, and other counties are being shut down, then we should be the ones getting the vaccine, vaccines to distribute to our con citizens. Right. Mr. Maron. Can, can I segue into another conversation that does come up with our, with our folks? Um, you get a lot of seniors that maybe aren't quite computer savvy and to have them have to go on every day that we're doing this is definitely tough for them, number one, but even why are we even doing it that way? I understand with the CARES, when we had the money we're handing out, we kind of did it that way just as we had so many people were giving out. Eventually, we're going to get to these vaccines. 
But maybe it should be a, a one-time thing that put the call in, get on the list, and if the list is 50,000 people long, so be it. But just at least you'll have that list and you know where you're at instead of having to go every day to try to get in there. And then for those that can't even do the computer work because they might have the assistance to it or might have the, the computer hookup, uh, to even let those that don't have that to be able to call in and get on a list. So I know it's a long way before we get to all yeah. this, but I think it's something we should, should address. I understand what you're saying, but it's not a list of just Pasco County people because anywhere in the state you can go to another county and receive that shot. So we're starting a new program? So Wait a minute, yeah, I was going to, we're, the health department CRD. is going to convert from the ever bright system to an, another system over the next couple of days. We actually got them under contract on Friday. They were working over the weekend because we thought we were going to have 3,700 shots to give out starting on Monday. That system will be rolled out this week. It's a different, it's more integrated. It's better. It's still web-based, um, but that will give us the ability to streamline our actual physical processing the shots faster because all the paperwork will be done and captured ahead of time. We will be opening, or the health of, so I could continue to, Mike and I, we're working on such a great team, I, I use a, the term we, um, but it is the health department is the lead on this. W are working to open up a St. Leo site later this week that is still on track now that we have some vaccine, we're gonna put it's some vaccine track. there. So the other thing we're doing is we are reaching out to the 55 plus communities. We've done one pod. We are building a list of them because that actually is a pr relatively logistics free way to give out shots because they do all the paperwork. They get everything. We show up and give shots. So we are working on that list. There's another one on some of the vaccine. We'll go to the next one on the list today or this week. And so we're, that's another way. The other way is both our libraries and our senior services are available to help people get on the list on the web, whether it's at our terminals that are in the libraries, those are available. So they can get into the libraries and we have several of them on the west side that are available and our senior <laughs> services can both help them get that done. This will evolve over time so that we will get to a list where we call you when we're ready. We're just not there in the, in the process yet. And, uh, and I've been talking to the gentleman who represents the state of Florida from this company at Salesforce, actually, um, that is behind this, um, can't remember the initials of this, CDR or CRD, um, but they're up and running in Orange County and it's going right. really well. Um, they are uh, Pinellas. There's a whole bunch of counties about to jump on this platform. And one of the good things it does is when you get your first shot, they they are automatically sign you up for your second. Oh, nice. So you don't uh, wait to one and wonder mm -hmm. when you're getting the second shot. Um, mm -hmm. There and there's all kinds of follow up um, with it. So uh, I'm excited about that. And um, also uh, the area. The group that, um, what is it, area? On Your agency aging? on aging? Um, yeah, so they're getting ready to, um, they're having a call tomorrow actually, uh, and the health department's jumping in on that call, and they're going to fan out to help seniors as well to learn how to do the program. But until we have the, it doesn't work for them to exactly. learn how to do Eventbrite because we're pivoting from Eventbrite. Yeah. So that's yeah. got to be on pause for a second. Well, the health. But, but this new program will be much better, much easier. And well, the health department also, they've been telling you when you go get the shot, I know when I'm getting my second shot. Yeah. They're setting that yeah, up. Yeah, they're already doing that. The they've been doing that all along. Yeah. So, but uh, it will there. convert to the new system. An, we get an email, yeah, because my mom got the shot, but it's, it's not as seamless as this one is going to be. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> going to try and get more counties to switch from Eventbrite onto this. I'm helping them. <laughs> If we, so. we got to get the vaccines though, right? If we don't have the yeah. vaccines, you can't get yeah. your second shot. And I don't know where you're at then. So, and but. I did want to touch on your 55 and older, because I know in Hernando County, they did a community and there was this big political brouhaha, uh -oh. but, um, get them all done. And, 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 and I'm sure you have to, and talking with our health director, you know, if we, if we're able, if we have the vaccine to fan out and just give as many shots as we can in a day, it's to everyone's benefit. And at these um, communities, uh, and it, again, it, even if it's a 55 and older, it's just the 65 and older that are getting the shots, okay? I'm just saying this for the public's benefit because I've been getting letters and, uh, and, uh, and questions. It's for the 65 and older, but we, it's less resources for the county um, to go in and, and give these shots in those, those um, communities. Um, the other thing I wanna ask though is, and I don't know if this is true, 
I didn't ask my friend where she heard this, but she told me that there are plain that the, there are chartered flights from Canada because you know the snowbirds didn't come down this year, but there are chartered flights of Canadians coming down to get shots in Florida. I I don't know if that's true, but that's true. I it's unsettling to me. Um, I I know it's a federal thing, not. It's, we have no control over the county line of who goes where. And frankly, um, I understand that a lot of the people who had signed up for the, um, was it Wednesday and Friday or whatever, the two days of shots in our county, the, they had 40 to 60 people not show up uh, because many of them went and got their shots in another county. And so they took a space on our list. Um, now they were able to call people and 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 the, uh -huh. I believe they distributed all the shots that they had, um, but it's a little bit chaotic what's going on there. And I, I'm sure it'll get better as it goes on. But God dang it, we gotta have our You're we right. gotta have our fair share. Right. They had a three person wait list, three hundred person wait list, citizen wait list, and with the thousand vaccines, they were gonna target those three hundred that were on that wait list, and then yeah, but they had to come down within you know fifteen minutes or twenty thing. minutes, so. I'm just, if there was a more, I don't know. Oh, I think Commissioner. Yeah, just, one, just one more thing to, the, to tie this all in together. Commissioner right. Moore, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so back to the people that aren't computer savvy, that are local people as well. You know, if, if we're going to try to work with the libraries to help these people get done, maybe we need to set up a program for the seniors that want to go down to the library and hook up. Benefit of that is, and again, we got to follow the federal regulations, et cetera. But if you're coming down to a library and we can sign you up there, the benefit is we know at least our people that are here are having a, a way to get set up as opposed to competing against the World Wide Web, whether it be Canada or wherever else coming in. So I think if we can kind of look at that, maybe take a, take a few days and kind of try to structure something, bring it back to us or just uh, do we'll it. Just execute. We'll just do it. As yeah, well. we'll just execute. Okay. You know, a YouTube With this video, when we have the process, a simple YouTube video that explains it. That's good. Yeah. Could work wonders. That's good. Yeah. With the new CDR program, they are working on, I believe, a call center to go along with There'll that. So ways. then the seniors can call the call center. Yeah. <laughs> My last thing. Thanks. I have one more. Yeah, sorry. Wait, um, no. The motion we, that was voted on was only to go to the state. There was an amendment after the motion oh, and so vote. The so we okay. voted for that also. You go to the. Yeah, yeah to send two letters. One, one to letters. the federal delegation, one, one to the state. Second. The friend File a motion to send second, a letter second. to the federal government. Second. All right. I got a motion and a second. All those in favor of the federal letter also? Aye. Thank you. Say aye. 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 Thanks. All opposed, like that? Cool. If you could, while you're, you're, there's a slide, I have a slide for my last item. And why is that, why are you putting that up? My uh, aunt and uncle are getting vaccined in uh, Polk County today, but my family in, around here, they don't have any vaccines, so they're not. <laughs> They're not getting vaccinated here. I don't know what Polk got, but I guess they got. So um, I'm sure everybody, will, you guys will love this one. So, you know, we, you know, we've had many workshops. We talk constantly. I've beaten this drum for years about apartment complexes in Pasco County, especially ones I'll just say within my district. Obviously, all our citizens, all our constituents, but in District Two. Um, so I went ahead and did something. So this is. I did a poll of residents in the Wesley Chapel in the Atlanta Lakes area. This was not funded with county dollars. I used my own account for this and paid for it. It cost $1,700. So I did a poll on apartment complexes. I'm not going to do the whole presentation for you guys because it could be a while, but I'm going to pull up a few slides here. Um, this poll was conducted by Sprice Strategies. It was done in December. So one thing you're gonna see is a, there are gonna be some unsure and no opinions because it was the holiday time, but I wanted to get this out because we have so many people that are coming in with apartment complexes and I wanted to get this out. Um, if you look at the first, uh, actually 400 respondents from zip codes within Wesley Chapel and some of Atlanta Lakes. The first slide, is there a way to take that See, on the top left, we can't read the uh, slide. And that's just, there you go, thanks. <laughs> Do you approve or disapprove of the amount of apartment buildings in your community? 
97 approve, 154 disapprove, 149 unsure or no opinion. So you had 38% overwhelming majority. Can you go to the next slide? Would you prefer to see more office and commercial development or more apartments being built? 196 would prefer to see more office and commercial. 15, 49%, 14.75% would prefer to see more apartments. Then you had the unsure or no opinions. Let's go to the next one, please. Do you believe more apartments should be built and approved in Pasco County? No, 57.75. Yes, 18.25. And then unsure or no opinion. I did this poll because, as many of you probably have heard from a lot of our constituents, I hear it every time I'm out practically. It's not a day goes by that I'm out, especially in the Wesley Chapel Lane, Lakes area, that I have somebody come up to me and start talking about this. I have even had COVID emails sent about vaccines that bring up the apartment subject in that email. That shows you how frustrated the community is when it comes to the amount of apartment complexes being built in that area. Again, I'm going to say that area. We know there's some areas on the west side. We said they could, they, they could be useful, right? I will leave it up to the district commissioners to make that decision. <laughs> but um, I, I, I thought this, I wanted to do this. I wanted to show you, I wanted to show the public that what I'm saying, almost every meeting, is not just coming out of my mouth. It's coming from the citizens' mouths that live in our area. And I have a sneaky suspicion if um, when it says the unsure and no opinions, that would have been a lot higher if it wasn't the holiday season. People probably want to get off the phone. They're probably like, leave me alone. Let's be honest. But I was willing to make that investment out of my account to do this just to obviously show everybody that um, we're, we have an issue. And we have a major issue that concerns many, many, many people. Um, like I said, not a day goes by that I don't hear about it. I could be out to dinner with my family, and I got people walking up to me talking about it. It comes up in conversations. Even my friends, why are you doing this? I'm not doing it. <laughs> so there's the poll. There's more slides. Um, I'm happy to have that email to each and every one of you if you like it. Okay, And that does it for me. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll bring those back up probably later this afternoon during the public <laughs> hearing on Mr. Stern? Um, I have a couple pictures. Um, one is uh, on December 10th. I was very excited to join um, the folks from the Lightning and some hockey players whose names I don't remember. <laughs> but I know they were famous Rough. guys. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> That's a good picture. <laughs> and, uh, and Mr. Stanley. Yeah. Um, as we dedicated our um, hockey rink um, opening in um, the uh, Holiday Rec, so the Ben Harrell Memorial Holiday Rec Center. So uh, that was pretty cool um, event. And uh, we're, the Lightning, you know, they won a few years ago and um, they, all their names are there on that bottom row. It's interesting what happens is as they add an, um, more teams, the top row comes off and gets preserved at the, uh, I guess it's at the hockey, there's a hockey library or museum somewhere. And I think that's where it goes. Cause I asked, does it just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? But no, they take that top row off and, um, and then off it goes to be preserved forever. So thank you so much to the lightning. Um, Keith had said that his phone was ringing off the hook before we, this even opened. So awesome. I'm really, uh, grateful that um, the kids are going to have something else to do and adults too um, in the county. Um, then I want to show you some pictures that I took over the last few days on my drive down 54 to my home in Gulf Harbors. It's really frustrating because you can see this right from State Road um, 54. Do you have those pictures? Did they did they come? The apartment pump. They, yeah, they would have been the Todd. The what? They would have been the Todd Jordan Newport Ritchie. They're the ones oh, we, we do them. not have them. Um, she said um, she just sent them. So if, if you can put them up, Jordan, um, Morgan said she thought. Yep, give, us, give us one sec. We'll get them up for you. Okay. I just checked in the property appraiser and one of the houses is a homesteaded house. Um, and the other house is a rental house, but how this can build up without 
notice from our staff is, I don't know, I, I just want to move to proactive and not reactive, but I did send an email in the other day and then they added more. And um, I sent the picture to Chase. Uh, I, I, I don't know how this car can even drive down the highway. Um, hopefully they're going to get up soon. Um, but while, while we're waiting for those to get up, uh, I wanted to say, if you, um, if you haven't had a chance, I would love for all of you to go visit the Coastal Anklo Trail. It's, we are just getting nothing but rave reviews, except for some of the emails that are coming in of the trucks and the ATVs that are still <coughs> driving out there at night. They go out there at night and they, they do wheelies and all kinds of things on our trail. So, um, you know, they've had free run of our land. We own about 200 acres out there. And then the Duke has some property um, for 20 something years. And I know it's taking a little while to um, make them realize that's not legal. The sheriff was out there last week and gave out eight or 10 tickets. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but I wondered if we couldn't see about putting a trailer there that would house either a parks employee or sheriff's deputy um, like there are in other facilities and maybe that will help. Ooh, that's not, that's kind of weird. <laughs> that didn't work in. That's like part of a photo. Yeah, windshield of a car, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Look at that car. Oh my. What are those? I don't know why this is zoomed in so close. If you need um, if you need a microwave, I guess you can go in the back. But how would you like to one. be driving down that car on the highway? There's no rope tying any of this on his truck. Um, I did talk to the gentleman yesterday. The whole family was out front. Oh, they did videotape me, so you might be able to hear the conversation somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a very nice man from Bosnia who who is collecting metal uh, to sell for money. Um, but he's running the business out of his front yard. And um, there are, and then we have kind of the same issue next door. And the neighbors are thrilled, That's right? That's the um, next door neighbor um, who's running, a, I guess, a window company out of his front yard. This yellow house is on the corner of 54 and Flamingo Drive. And the house to the right is one house in from State Road 54. And... I just hope that um, we can get out to these people right away. But I, I just, we have to have our staff driving by and seeing this. And I, I wish I wasn't, I don't know, maybe I should retire from County Commission and join the Code Enforcement Office. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it's really bad for that community. I feel bad for them. So, um, and I think that's it for me. All right, thank you. Not a garbage can in sight. We have we have two minutes. Have you got very much on your business? Well, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Hey, Mr. Chairman, do we really need to wait? I mean, can we not just get done with everybody's items? Yeah. I mean, we can. is anybody going anywhere during lunch? I mean, it just takes a minute to take a picture. Yeah. We don't have to do 1145, yeah, do we? We can get through. I think originally it was supposed to be 12 be, anyways. I think okay. the pictures were supposed to be 12. Somehow it got on the agenda at 1145. It was supposed to be noon. Yeah. That's just a thought. So now another opportunity. Because yeah. they might have something they want to say now before public hearing on them. It's whatever you have on your plate. <laughs> so. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So we have the human traffic and reconciliation. Okay. And I just wanted to say a few words. Okay. And also, I did visit Victory high school and thank you commissioner moore for helping introduce them as well i did go to their ribbon cutting and then let me go back to the human trafficking um awareness month so good morning thank you chairman oakley for allowing me to address the human trafficking issue and present the resolution the human trafficking is best described as the exploitation of individuals where they are focused to work for and exchange sex for anything of value pasco county has recognized the criminal nature of human trafficking and in 2014 attacked the problem head on by forming the commission on human trafficking the commission is made up of 13 members of the variety of areas across 
our community, including the school board, county government, law enforcement, and hospitality industry. They all band together to fight against this modern form day of slavery. Florida is ranked number three for the most calls to the human trafficking hotline. Florida is also number three in the nation for the most human trafficking cases. In 2019, in 2019, there were 819 cases reported. We need to lower this figure. And the only other two that were higher than the state of Florida was California and Texas. The commission created a complete campaign to help curb the human trafficking including working on ordinance 1634 which mandated that the signage offering to help victims be posted in restrooms and restaurants of sexually oriented businesses the commissioner has the commission has produced public service announcements that have made over 2 million impressions so far human trafficking often occurs near large events that bring in groups from out of town such as super bowl People sometimes act differently when they're not at home. We have Super Bowl coming to the area, Bay Area soon. We want to <laughs> highlight the efforts of the Commission on Human Trafficking. They have developed a campaign that addresses human trafficking called Pasco Doesn't Buy It. There are bus wraps and digital billboards and websites too. Even Pasco bus drivers are receiving special training on human trafficking. We want to be sure that we rid our community of this horrible crime and we thank you are thankful for the works of the Pasco Commission on Human Trafficking. So thank you to the fellow board members for helping with this important topic. Thank you. Okay, that's it. All right, Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to bring one item back later on today, but let me just do these quick ones real quick. Um, uh, Terry Pitos, um, I'd like you to try to get me updated later on on pilot country, also SunWest as far as those uh, comp plan changes we're looking to do in. Uh, see how we're doing there. Um, and I want to say staff did a phenomenal job on the Beacon Woods roundabout, uh, did a phenomenal job. The connection to uh, the Walmart and Country Club Estates is operating s unbelievably smoothly every step of the way. And the item I'm going to talk about later on today will be uh, at Gulf Harbors, at the Woodlands. They're starting their own dredging project separate from the rest of the project. And they're looking to get some stormwater help, something that Commissioner Wells mentioned a long time ago. He supported. Um, I thought it was good at, depending on the scenario. So I'll bring that later on when I have a little bit more information. So I'll have enough. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Mr. Miles. Yes, sir. I'll just uh, go over a couple things real quick. Um, if you drove up 54 or I'm sorry, 75, you saw the construction going on at our overpass interchange. Just make sure everybody's aware that interchange will be open to traffic in summer of 22. So that's just around the corner. Awesome. It actually, may be open to traffic before the divergent diamond. That's um, what I said before. I, did, I didn't want to go there, Commissioner, that. but that's, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting the same date on the divergent diamond finish. So, um, as, as you know, we started the 22 budget process and we're kicking that off this month. Uh, we will bring a presentation to the board to discuss revenue projections and stuff like that at the first March meeting. That's kind of the, the plan at this point as we move through the process. And then finally, I sent, I think, all you kind of an update on building permits in calendar year 20. Uh, what I didn't send you, and I just, we just found out because Hillbro posts theirs as well, is that actually the last quarter of 20, we issued 1,794 single family residential permits. That same quarter, Hillsboro issued 1,632 single family new permits. So we actually issued more permits that quarter than Hillsboro did on the single family home side. That, that's mainly because we basically doubled year over year the number of permits we were pushing through building construction in that time period. And they have a moratorium. Well, they, I mean, they're still issuing significant permits, they're, but yeah. they they didn't see a jump of double like like we did over the last really six months in, in BCS. And so, as you know, we're working several things because you don't go from 300 permits to 600 permits and not have a level service issues. So we're working several things to try to address level service issues, including you know, one of the items you approved today, but also removing the administrative fee from the private providers for a short period of time to try to help offload some of that load. We're working on how do we streamline some other parts of the process as well. So just wanted to update you on that. And that's all I have. Sorry, I have more good news, but I'll let, I'll wait, we'll send it out later. Well, that's a very important what you added on on the bill and construction going through all those permits because they're stacked up and there's a lot of complaints not moving, but it's because you got such a backlog of permits coming in all the time. So, Mr. Steinsteiner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, 
following up on Commissioner Moore's um, survey results, uh, I just want to make it clear to the board that if the board sees the future of Pasco County differently than its current comp plan and land development code, it has the it has the policy choice to do that. But you need to do that through your comprehensive plan and your land development code. Well, you are going to be limited in the projects that are coming forward in addressing them in the context of your land development code and comprehensive plan, um, even if your constituents see a different vision for Pasco County. So what I'm saying is that's a legislative decision you're going to have to make. You don't make that decision on a project by project basis. There may be reasons not to approve a project based on your current comprehensive plan and land development code, but survey results are not going to be one of those things you can use for that. I'm not sure I'm sure that's not why the commissioner raised that that issue. I think he sees it, it as a larger policy discussion that the board needs to have, but I felt I needed to say that yeah. especially going into this afternoon where there's a multifamily project. On sure, the sure. And Mr. Chairman, let me just respond to that. And I appreciate that. And again, yes, this is, you know, I looked at an overall area, uh, you know, multiple zip codes um, for that survey. I think there was, what was there, four? Again, I have it on my list, four zip codes. Some of that did go into, you know, like say Commissioner Starkey's district because it's right across, you know, it's on 56 as well. Um, and over in the area, over uh, in the Lutz area, like, you know, that's on the opposite side of District Two as well. As well. So yes, that is that. And yes, as you stated, Mr. Steinsteiner, there are um, if things are inconsistent with the Land Development Code, this board has the full authority to deny a project if they are inconsistent with the Land Development Code. So if a project comes forward and we can show those inconsistencies, we can deny those projects, um, which we have in the past. Um, but yes, that's that was more for um, uh, letting people know the feelings of the area, and you can always do things like moratoriums to move forward. But we're not going to talk about that right now, unless somebody else wants to. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. I do have um, a few items, mostly of gratitude. Um, especially to the county. One is um, the Pasco County 2020 team of the year was for the Pasco and community cares team. And I wanted to um, tell the board thank you and my appreciation because in that team awards, you recognized our office as part of the extended team of the county. And um, I just wanted to say that the whole um, cares um, project that we worked on together was just um, a great example of how government agencies work well together and especially here in Pasco County. Um, I am I'm very grateful to have the relationship that our offices have together. So um, to do good things in our community. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate all the hard work of all the departments that were involved. Um, we worked um, especially a lot with Kathy Pearson's group um, with the um, community development and it was just a great partnership and there were many, many other departments of the county um, that helped in that endeavor and um, I just I'm grateful that we could take part in something so wonderful for our community. Um, <coughs> The second piece of gratitude I would like to um, tell the, to the commissioners and to your team is um, for the acquisition of the Cisco video conferencing system for my office. Um, that has um, been tremendously impactful. Um, I took um, my new term started Tuesday of last week and as um, part of my duties I needed to deputize my team um, to deputize around 300 people um, and make sure that it was safe. Um, the Cisco system was absolutely imperative. Um, it was wonderful. I was able to hold four sessions simultaneously throughout the day to connecting six locations in the office to make sure that everyone was safe to properly deputize them. Um, it went perfectly. I wanted to thank um, especially Todd Kersey, who spent many hours with us to make sure everything went smoothly, and it did, and it's one working wonderfully. So thank you for allowing me to start my, my, uh, my new term um, smoothly. That's greatly appreciated. 
It will allow connectivity with our office and the county, the courts, and also outside parties. So it was a great investment and we greatly appreciate that. Um, my third and last thing is to let everyone know that we have our big shred event coming up uh, at the end of this month. This is um, in, in line with Data Privacy Day, free shredding services of your documents. We partner again with the county to, to do this. And we have it scheduled for Newport Ritchie. It'll be at the, um, the West Pasco Judicial Center on the 30th of this month from 10 um, a.m. till noon. And we will hold another session on February 6th at the Robert Sumner Judicial Center in Dade City, right here, um, not in this location, but across the way there um, to participate. Um, you would just need to either bring three banker's boxes, up to three banker's box size of documents or two kitchen size trash bags to, of your documents for us to shred. Please remove metal objects on them, staples and clips. And just to let you know, last year, um, Newport Ritchie, we had 5.5 tons of paper were shredded at that event. 264 cars came through the line. Dade City, not as big because it was a rain day um, that day, but people still made it out. We had 82 cars and two tons in Dade City that day. So we're hoping to also help our community that day for those two days as well. Okay. That's it. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair. I have a reappoint Dr. Andrew Jonathan uh, Michael Aliga to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Board for District 1. So that's a motion. I need a second. Second. I got a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Uh, next uh, motion is to uh, reappoint Mark Philman and Andrew Pittman to the at-large committee members on the VOPH Planning and Policy Committee. Their terms have, have expired and need, needs to be done today with the board. So I, that is a motion. I need a second. Second. A second. A motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion pass. Okay. The last thing I have is uh, we talked about overpass and all the construction going on there. Uh, I think, I don't know if the road's closed right now, but February 1st was the date I was given that the road would be closed, uh, the, by, the overpass would be closed for that construction. So is that still? I'll need to verify that. I think that's one of the dates I but think. But February 1st is what I that, was that's told supposed and to, DOT said they were going to get out and let everybody know right. also. And that's supposed to accelerate construction by six to nine months. Yeah. The closure of that. Right. So, and I, can I have an alibi? Okay. Mr. Chairman. Think, yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick also had, you reminded her that she's got an appointment she needs to make. Oh, okay. Thank you. I would like to appoint Kayla Cooney to the library advisory board. Second. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you. That is it. Hey. <laughs> Mr. Chair, real quick, I remember yes, the clerk reminded me of something. The supplemental cares appropriation that the Congress and the president signed right around the Christmas holidays included another allocation for specifically for rental and mortgage assistance that will be direct distributed to counties. We applied for that. Uh, we've not received the money yet, but you will see an agenda item on the next board meeting to accept that. We're estimating that's going to be in the range of about $15 million. One five or five? One five. Uh, but we're not sure because the numbers haven't been worked out yet and Treasury hasn't posted the actual numbers for each jurisdiction. So we've applied for that. You'll see that in front of you. It's specific to rental and mortgage, a little more strings attached than in our program, but we're working through that to get that set back up to do that. And as the clerk mentioned, our team of the year was a CARES team. Uh, Mr. Todd Kersey, who's on the line today, was the uh, employee of the year, a team member of the year, and then Tambry Lane, who you're all familiar with, was the leader of the year. So that's all I had, sir. Congratulations. And meeting with a good note, one of the good notes. So. Thank you. Uh, okay. One comment on that CARES okay. money. Uh, so I, the uh, government did extend the deadline mm -hmm. for um, us to spend the money. So, you know, we were in this rush to just in case for December 31st, but they did give us an extension to December 31st of 2021, correct? That is correct. Um, you know, unfortunately, we got that extension three days before we were supposed to be 100% executed. And so we were 100% executed. Our nonprofits that didn't spend all their money have, we've extended the date now so they can continue to work on those issues into the new year. But 
the CARES money was expensed because we were supposed to be 100% expensed on the 30th of December. And when you extend my deadline two days before that, well, I'm sorry, we're already going to be expensed at that point. Now that was another um, unfortunate rollout. <laughs> hey, Mr. Chairman, are, are you, you going to bring up the letter that um, Senator Fasano sent to us? Did you want to bring that up or? Uh, I've asked for um, for a comment from the attorney's office. Okay. Based on that, then, to get that answer back before I move forward with it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just I know we were all copying on letters. So I didn't know if it was coming up today. You haven't asked for yet, or <laughs> no? No. <laughs> you haven't had. Time but I was having them yet. look at it before okay. we would bring that forward. So. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. That's everything for now. Uh, we'll break for lunch, but we have photos here and then photos for human trafficking out front. I believe that Mr. Fitzpatrick will leave us in. All right.